Thank you, Eric, for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Daniel M. Rossi. Daniel is recognized as one of the founding cre cre creators of the emerging AI art movement. His speech title is Dreamscapes, a collaboration of nature, man, and machine. Please welcome Daniel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's make sure that we can see this. All right. Are you guys seeing the first slide? Okay, I hope this is working. I'm getting a, I'm sorry, I'm getting a very bad echo on my side. Um, let's see if there's anything we can do about that interpreter. Sorry for this. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to go. Everything you're seeing right now is being computed and yes, rendered it's the... in your mind in real time by you. Try to keep that in mind throughout this presentation. My plan over the next 20 minutes or so is to take you through the art history, the technology, and even the psychology behind our Dreamscapes project. I say our project because it truly was a collaborative effort, one with quite a few surprises along the way. I hope you'll find this fun and perhaps learn some new things that you can apply to your own projects. Just a heads up that unless otherwise noted, all of the images in this presentation are my own work, but per my first comment, you are actively reconstructing them. Let's start by talking about special places. What I mean by that are precise locations in our world where something very powerful happens. And I'm not just talking about landscapes, but also cityscapes and even indoor spaces. Have you ever noticed that in certain places at certain times, this the scene before you goes beyond a mere sight and becomes something you feel in your body. Have you ever had that feeling? Whenever I find myself in the midst of such scenes, it's like a bell rings. It stops me dead in my tracks. What starts as a visual perception immediately becomes a visceral experience, one that I feel right in the middle of my chest, usually because it makes me gasp. And when a scene is powerful enough to make that happen, I then find myself waxing philosophical, asking questions like, I wonder how a hummingbird sees this? Or what would I see if my vision was many times sharper? What's real anyway? I'm sure many of you have experienced something like this too in the presence of special places, this powerful connection that is quickly formed between your eyes, your body and your mind thereby evoking an experience that is not just visual, but is also visceral and cognitive. And if you're like me and many other people in the history of mankind, I suspect, you then find yourself desperately wanting to bottle that experience with such fidelity that when you share it with others later, the same thing happens to them. Also like me, you may have found it very hard to do that with traditional photography. This drove me crazy. It had me wondering what constitutes this phenomenon and how can it be communicated? Is it even possible? My burning desire to answer this question affirmatively and capture it in a two-dimensional image 
this comprehensive eye, body, mind experience that I was having at special places in the real world has been my obsession for well over a decade now and is the core intention that continues to drive this project. Which brings us to our first surprise. We have some strong clues that it is possible. The great American painters of the Hudson River School in the early 1800s and the European romanticists before them painted highly detailed scenes, some of which were 10 feet wide or more with great emotional impact. Painters like Thomas Cole, who is considered the founder of the Hudson River School and his incredibly skilled friend, Asher Durand and several others created many powerful works like these. Cole's protege, Frederick Church was hugely successful at doing this. Take for example, this painting is called the Heart of the Andes. When this five and a half foot high by 10 foot wide masterpiece debuted in 1859, it was an absolute sensation. It was exhibited first in New York City as a single painting exhibition. In four weeks, more than 12,000 people paid admission to view this one painting. Um, the painting was widely acclaimed. Poetry was written in its honor. A composer dedicated a piece to it. Even Mark Twain wrote about it. So how did these great landscape painters of the Hudson River School achieve this effect, something that's become known as the pastoral experience? I believe there's a simple answer and a more complicated one. The simple answer is that on the shoulders of 200 years of dedicated landscape painters in the Western world, these highly skilled individuals perfected the art of painting the way they actually saw. Importantly, their vision was not influenced by the way cameras see as photography had not yet become widespread. We'll come back to that issue in just a bit. Hold on, there we go. Okay, um, the more complex answer, which I'll illustrate with my own work, starting with this scene I captured in the Dolomites, is that they paid careful attention to four things, subject matter, composition, technique, and presentation. Let's briefly consider these one at a time, starting with subject matter. The pastoral experience occurs with scenes featuring things like green fields. It also includes water scenes. Oh, sorry. Uh, hill and country scenes. Uh, tended gardens pleasing skies, and so on. But it's not just about subject matter. It's also about composition. Specifically, it's about conveying a sense of immersion, compatibility, and extent. Immersion is best achieved with the presence of strong foreground elements and or wide fields of view, like you see here. Compatibility refers to the resonance between the natural setting and human inclinations. Essentially, man-made elements subconsciously make the viewer feel safe. They sense that other people are thriving there. And then there's extent which is characterized by scenes of distant wilderness, trails and paths leading to idyllic destinations and a sense of being connected to a larger world. Talking about technique brings us to surprise number two. The Hudson River School masters spent decades learning and refining their ability to capture what they saw with brushes and paints. But per my earlier remarks, I found myself asking the question, can a camera be forced to see the world the way human eyes do? Or more pointedly, how can we achieve the pastoral effect with a digital camera? After a lot of research and experimentation, almost 10 years ago at a canyon in Utah, it suddenly hit me that it requires a computational photography technique I call XYZ photography. 
They say necessity is the mother of invention. In this case, there was literally no other way to capture this scene. There I was engulfed by this amazing geological formation called the double arch alcove, which looked awesome to my human eyes, but presented numerous challenges to my camera, which you can see here. The alcove in the lower right, in the lower left is in deep shadow. The ideal view was pointed directly into the morning sunlight and the opposite canyon wall prevented me from walking far enough back to take in the full extent of the double arch. So here's what I did. I captured multiple views horizontally, let's call that X, multiple views vertically, let's call that Y, and multiple exposures deep from dark to light, let's call that Z. It's not really depth, it has nothing to do with distance. It's about capturing a higher dynamic range of exposures. I then used three different commercial graphic software packages to merge this cubic array of photos into a coherent scene. I blended the multiple exposures from front to back with an HDR program. I stitched together the multiple views with the panoramic stitcher. And then I cropped the image with Photoshop and adjusted the total range a little bit to reduce the haze. This process enabled me to go from this, a single exposure, to this 60 exposures stitched and blended together. You can see that the XYZ method yields an image that is much more immersive, more vibrant, and much higher resolution. This combination of features is indeed how human eyes see and is the result of the XYZ approach, essentially forcing the camera to see the world the way we do. By the way, I found out later, I wasn't the first to do this, but because this technique is a lot trickier than it sounds, I remain one of the few photographers dedicated to this approach. Finally, when we consider presentation, we discover that pastoral images are healing art. A friend of mine who works for the American Heart Association pointed this out to me and shared with me peer-reviewed research papers providing evidence that the only kind of art shown to have a measurable and positive impact on healing and well-being are representational pastoral landscape images. This impact is enhanced by how these images are presented. Like Frederick Church's Heart of the Andes to be most impactful, these scenes should be, in my opinion, no less than eight feet wide, and ideally they should be backlit as this really enhances their immersiveness. A big bonus about light boxes is that they are containers. It's very easy to replace the image periodically to keep things fresh. Figuring all this out led me to deploying healing art light boxes to very positive effect in a number of senior living, mental health and medical facilities. And then about six years ago, a huge surprise unfolded. It turns out that the entire time I was conducting my XYZ photography experiments, there had been this incredible revolution taking place in artificial intelligence and deep learning. Related to this, back in the summer of 2015, Google released a bit of open source software called Deep Dream that became a viral sensation. Deep Dream was a diagnostic tool originally created to help Google researchers understand how their own software was working. And what they found when they applied Deep Dream to the task of image recognition was that the machine was essentially hallucinating as it tried to figure out what it was seeing. After they decided to release this software, the internet went crazy. Heard these headlines, what most people did with this was they turned their family photos into psychedelic nightmares. Now, these are not my own here, um, but as you can see, some of these results were quite intriguing. I, however, sensed an opportunity to do something a bit more subtle. So I tried applying Deep Dream with a light touch to some low resolution previews of my landscape images and was very surprised to find that this mashup of computational photography and artificial intelligence showed such promise. My initial test results were very well received, which was encouraging, but they really excited me because I realized this gave me an opportunity to add a level of expressiveness to my landscapes that could be very rich. And just like the art world in the 1800s began moving to more expressive individualized modes of painting landscapes, starting with the proto-impressionism of J.M.W. Turner, 
And later, the true impressionism seen, for example, in the pointillism of Seurat and the unique styles of folks like Cezanne and Monet, I thought I too might be able to take my landscapes in a new direction, one that would hopefully add a cognitive response to the visceral reaction people were already having with my XYZ images. If so, this would complete my quest to evoke that I body mind experience that I was seeking all along, which I determined was essential to communicating the power of special places. Unfortunately, Deep Dream, as released, was simply not designed to operate successfully on giant images like this 63 shot scene I captured in Central Park. It would just crash. I was completely stuck. And that's when I thought of my friend at Google, Joseph Smar. Much to my delight and amazement, Joseph agreed to help me and he in turn convinced his friend at NVIDIA, Chris Lamb, to help him. This was a huge stroke of luck for me. These two brilliant guys were exactly the right people to undertake this effort. Turns out it took a lot of work to keep Deep Dream from crashing on my images. After four months of hacking on nights and weekends, they finally got it working using a monster compute server with four graphics processing units up on the Amazon cloud. My job would then be to learn how to tune the parameters of Deep Dream for the best results on my landscape images. When we first started to get results, I was delighted to see the following happen. Some, I suspected it would, but I wasn't totally sure. Something I called the museum experience. One thing I always enjoyed when visiting museums is this far versus near dichotomy. When you enter a gallery space on the opposite wall, you may see a large, gorgeous, almost photographic painting. But when you get right up close to it, you see all the brush strokes and perhaps some hidden details. It's like having two entirely different experiences and it leaves you wondering how it all comes together. Besides the expressiveness that Deep Dream lent to my work, another thing that excited me when I saw these results was the opportunity to participate in another art tradition, that of camouflage and dual meaning, such as you find in the works of Archimboldo back in the Renaissance, who painted portraits composed entirely of fruits, vegetables, flowers, etc. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Abbot Thayer, whose interest in protective coloration in nature, ultimately led to the use of military camouflage during World War I. And of course, the great Salvador Dali, whose works are filled with illusion and multiple meanings. So just a couple months after Joseph and Chris handed me the keys to the interface they built for me, NVIDIA Corporation, excited by how well these artworks illustrated the power of their graphics chips, purchased these three giant backlit dreamscapes to showcase at the GPU Technology Conference that they host annually in San Jose, California. It was really exciting to get a chance so soon after our breakthrough to see the reactions of about 5,500 people to this new work. I'm happy to report they were a big hit, but the coolest part was yet another surprise. Namely, that we see what we expect to see until we can no longer deny that we're seeing something else. What I've observed is that the distance at which a person can no longer see the hallucinations hidden in my dreamscapes is at least twice as far away from the print once the person knows those hallucinations are there. That means that the first time they approach my work, there is an entire span in that approach where they are unconsciously biasing themselves toward their expectations. Then suddenly at say three feet away, it hits them that things are not at all what they seem. That's always a fun moment to observe, usually because it involves some shrieking, but it's especially fascinating to me how much further back they have to walk to unsee the hallucinations once they've learned the truth. So I'd like to show you a handful of other dreamscapes in my collection, along with a detail of each to give you a sense of the variety of form Deep Dream enables. 
For example, let's take a look at this capture of the Point Montero Lighthouse, which is just a few miles north of my home here in Half Moon Bay, California, and zoom into this detail here in this red box. One thing about Deep Dream that amazes me and puts it light years ahead of conventional photo filters is that no matter how coarse the hallucinations, it maintains a high degree of details in the scene, as you can see here in the bike racks and in the picket fences. I've no, I, I have no idea how it does that, I'm, but I'm glad it does. The results are far richer for this. This was captured, this next one, during uh, sunrise at the High Ute Ranch in Park City, Utah. This is one of my favorite dreaming styles. It's very impressionistic. Um, again, notice the way the fine details are preserved in the reeds in the foreground, despite the relatively large scale of the hallucinations. Perhaps some of you recognize this as the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. I love how delicate the dreaming style is on this one. It seems quite appropriate to me, given the subject matter. By the way, not all of the light boxes I produce are one of a kind, full scene, eight feet tall dreamscapes. I also have a line of limited edition 40 by 40 inch dreamscape details as shown here. Another detail I pulled from my tea garden dreamscape. Here is Echo Canyon in Zion National Park in Utah. I chose this dreaming style because it seems so compatible with the rock formations. It almost looks as though the Native Americans carved every square inch of the canyon. Finally, this capture of the Azalea Walk in Central Park, that 63 shot scene I showed you earlier, I love what Deep Dream did here with the azaleas, but one thing that blows me away is how incredibly varied the dreaming is with this particular style. The effects alongside the path on the trees and buildings and in the sky are all quite different, which is another indication of how much more sophisticated and contextual deep dream is than say a Photoshop filter. This brings us to our final surprise. One of the most intriguing things you'll hear about working with artificial intelligence is how its alien way of interpreting the world or solving problems or even designing things can lead humans to new approaches and insights. For example, the odd moves played by the AI software AlphaGo the first computer program to beat the world's best human players of Go, one of our oldest and toughest board games, has made those human Go masters even better by opening their minds to styles of play no human would previously consider as viable. AlphaGo was literally a game changer. Similarly, my extensive exposure to Deep Dream's manner of interpreting my landscape images has literally changed the way I see the real world. At certain times, under certain lighting conditions, I catch myself actually seeing these crazy forms and shapes. Deep Dream has enabled me to see creatively. I mean, the truth is, as I alluded to in my opening remarks, seeing already is a creative act entirely, but now I can see in a different, less biased way. Last but not least, I wanted to take you through a few of my newer works. Recently, I've been experimenting with dreaming in multiple passes at multiple scales. I call these grand scale dreamscape details. Unlike my previous full scene dreamscapes, which appear to be a photographic reality from a distance, but reveal themselves to be a digital fantasy up close, these scenes are clearly hallucinatory from considerable viewing distances, yet still reveal unexpected details at close range, as you can see here. The challenge for me with these works is to find two or more dreaming styles that are not only compatible with the source photography, but which are also compatible with each other. 
This piece was printed as an eight by eight foot light box and was featured in the entry hall at the Art Palm Beach International Art Fair. In case you're curious, here's the full scene from which this detail was pulled, which was captured at a place called The Needle on the island of Maui. Here's a piece of the Bow Bridge in Central Park, um, dreamed initially in a style I like to think of as Tim Burton-esque, especially in the trees. Up close, this looks to me like something Gustav Klimt would have painted. This eight by 12 foot print is now installed in the giant Google building in New York City. Here's a scene I captured in Hanalei on the island of Kauai, initially dreamed in a flowing impressionistic style. I chose this secondary dreaming style because its vegetal nature seemed quite appropriate at this scale given the subject matter. A couple of years ago, I was the sole artist invited to exhibit at the launch event for the new Institute for Human-Centered AI at Stanford University. I printed the Hanalei piece at eight by 16 feet and met a bunch of tech celebrities that day, including this guy, my hero, Demis Hassabis, who is the founder of DeepMind, the Google company that developed AlphaGo, the game-changing AI software I mentioned a couple minutes ago. So I thought it might be helpful to end the formal part of this presentation by sharing some lessons I've learned from this project and that maybe you can apply to your own projects, hobbies, or business. First and foremost, get clear about your intentions. If what you're trying to do can't be clearly stated in a few simple words, it can probably be further refined or distilled. In my case, it was simply capture and convey the power of special places. Study the past, even the distant past. Great landscape paintings created centuries ago opened new horizons for me. Try using existing tools in new ways. No new camera equipment, hardware, or software was required to develop my XYZ photography technique. Keep an eye out for new tools, techniques, and technologies, even ones not necessarily designed to solve your particular problem. Deep Dream was certainly not developed to take landscape art into the 21st century. Mash it up. In his latest book, The Runaway Species, neuroscientist David Eagleman and his co-author, Anthony Brandt, contend that bending, breaking, and blending are the three ways in which human creativity remakes the world. That's pretty much what I did here. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You just might get it. I couldn't have taken this project over the goal line without Joseph and Chris, which never would have happened if I was too shy or embarrassed to ask for their help. Choose a partner who sees things differently from you. This could open your mind and enhance your own creativity. Turns out these days, your partner doesn't even have to be human. Finally, stay curious, be creative. As far as I can tell, curiosity and creativity is the two-stroke engine of progress. Thank you. I have uh, immediately a question. The first yes. point was get clear about your own intentions. And my question is, Working with a partner like AI, how much control you can have on your intentions? Well, let, let's remember that I started with a very specific artistic intent. Um, and I wrestled an AI into submission to serve that intent. Um, it certainly has um, a different way of seeing things. 
Um, but it has almost an infinite amount of variety within its finite repertoire of, of motifs that it can yield. It's up to me to curate that and choose things that I feel are delivering on my intent. So while I know my AI is not sentient, because it continues to surprise me, I feel like I'm collaborating with a partner, but I think it's safe to say that I'm the conductor, the leader of the band, and the AI is playing one of the instruments in the band. Um, I want to say that uh, I, I love your work. It's fantastic, beautiful, amazing aesthetics. But we are here debating the role of the author. Who is the author? And uh, I think the um, question that uh, Filippo was alluding at was that, um, and I also have the same question, is uh, your first work, the XYZ, is fantastic because I can see you have a control over it. I mean, again, the results are not that spectacular, but it is your intention going through. The second part where the AI comes in, I see a distancing because again, it's not a brush. It's not a random event. It's an intelligent agent that is sitting between you and your work. And that in a way has sort of like a push and pulls where you actually can control, as you said, as a conductor, but again, there is a certain black box area into your own mind, basically, if you we consider you to be the author. And that is where our questioning came today. I mean, I get, it's not a question, really, it's more of a comment, but I think you would be one of the few people who would be able to kind of detect that because you do have the technical expertise since you proved that in your beginning of your work. And then at some point, you may have lost it. I mean, that's not not necessarily in the sense of losing as you don't know what you're doing, but in the sense that somebody is in, in interfering into your work. That, that's, that's the comment, I guess, that we're trying to get. And again, anything you say is, would be fantastic for our, uh, for, for our curiosity. Yeah, I think that's one, one of the wonderful things about this tool. Uh, and it really is a tool, but as you pointed out, it is a bit of a black box. Um, and that ability to surprise me is a kind of tool like none I've ever had before. And that's why it feels like a collaborator. Um, and I, I think it's a wonderful thing and it's taken my work to places that I could not get without its, its own perception. It, it, it's in effect, the way in which it's perceiving my images and interpreting those images is something that brings a new level of, of um, cognition and, and expression, um, which serves my goal of creating beautiful images that make people think. Fair enough, fair enough. And um, I think that uh, it will be very creative on your side to actually engage into the tool making yourself. Like, why is it that the neural network that you're using should be somebody else? What if, what if you actually go and do it? You make your own neural network and uh, then you would be the one who would run the show. And I get, that's not that difficult as from my point of view. Right. Yeah, training, training the data set is something that a lot of AI artists do with their own um, data. Uh, I started out uh, just really wanting to use the open source Google code, which was trained on open source um, ImageNet data. Uh, so that limits the motifs that are available to me, uh, which that image, that data set had a lot of dogs and things in it, which is why when you get down into the deeper levels of the neural net, you see those sorts of motifs. Um, but the truth is I prefer the higher levels that are more impressionistic. And even if I trained it with a different data set, um, I think I would still find that I'd be using sort of those higher level, more impressionistic abstract uh, motifs. 
So it served my purpose for now. Uh, I haven't felt the absolute need to train it on my own data, but that certainly is doable. And a lot of AI artists do exactly that. I just feel I haven't yet exhausted the possibilities of the open source um, code and, and, and default training data set that uh, Google provided. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.